the pairings came about sort of, I wouldn't say randomly, because we certainly put characters together who haven't really spent much time together. Spock and McCoy was a, a key one, because I felt, and Doug felt, that we'd, we'd seen the Kirk-Spock relationship quite extensively in the previous two films. It's time to let that go for a while and come back to it later on when they've known each other a bit longer. I feel like they've been through almost a lifetime's journey in the first two films. We don't really need to kind of linger on that too much now. And the relationship between Spock and Bones has always been fascinating, to your coin of phrase, and very funny, you know, because they are so diametrically opposed to each other in so many ways. And yet, somewhere there is a great friendship, and we wanted to explore that. Um, with Scotty and Jayla, we like the idea of Scotty finding a kind of adept, young sort of engineer, like someone who has a mechanical skill which impresses him. Um, with uh, with um, Uhura and Sulu, um, that changed around a little bit. There was a time when it was just Uhura in there, and then um, Sulu, I think Sulu was somewhere else and then came to the thing. But we kind of like the idea of those two as an odd pairing. And in terms of Chekhov and Kirk, it's just that you've got the boy and the man, you know, there's a, there's a great sort of interplay, juxtaposition between Chekhov's very excitable enthusiasm and Kirk's now faintly jaded kind of attitude towards things. So, um, yeah, the, the, those pairings all felt kind of right, you know. I feel like Scotty is probably the least bothered by everything. You know, he kind of, he's in his element when he's in the engine room. He, he, he likes his job very much, and <coughs> I'm sure he complains more than anyone, but I'm, he's probably the, the most satisfied of everybody. So I feel like he's kind of, he's not in a terrible place, you know, and we, when, we, when we join him, he's kind of doing his thing, which is to be in the guts of the ship, keeping it moving, you know, that's what he kind of lives for. I think the Star Trek persists and, and, and is here in its 50th year because it is such an optimistic idea. It's, it's the, the rehearsal of the notion that we might not perish because of our own stupidity. It's, it's the idea that we might actually succeed and become a, a noble and productive and, you know, inclusive, cooperative species. It's what we all kind of secretly hope for, I think. It's a universe where <clears throat> we're all accepted. It's a universe where there's no judgment or prejudice. Uh, it, it's just, it's all about hope. It, it offers us our own future the idea of our own future writ large. And it's such an, it's such an irresistible thing, you know. Um, and as long as we, you know, have some hope that we might not become victims of our own sort of hubris, um, people will, will, will love it, you know. And it's, it's such a, this feels like such a big deal, this one. Not just because it's the 50th one, but it's, it's the first Star Trek since we lost Leonard Nimoy. And there's a lot of, significance in this one in terms of its its symbolic meaning and um, that the, the the weight of that hasn't ever felt light on myself and Doug's shoulders or Justin or Lindsay or JJ or anybody I'm sure um, it means a lot to us that this film kind of resonates with the fans and with people who've never seen Star Trek you know did you know that filming on the Hunger Games catching fire left Jennifer Lawrence temporarily deaf in one ear Hmm, sorry, what was that you said? For this and more movie flacks, click on more videos. But if you want something else, click on the playlist.